are Matthew Berger, Wyatt Chang, John Height, Brian Kindergan, Christian Lickner, Kevin Martins, Josh Mascara, and Jason Regier. Is this on? Hey, how are you guys doing? Good. Awesome. So this is the uh, Reaper Soul Q&A panel. We're going to do a little something different for this one. We're going to ask you guys all the questions. So are we okay with that? All right. Awesome. All right. So um, as you see, we have quite a few of us here. We have uh, you know, our tech director. We have our um, art director, our production director, our lead game designer our uh, le uh, senior level designer for console, and we have Wai Chang, who will tell you more about his favorite class in a minute. But uh, all right, let's get right into the questions. Um, it said that there, some of them are account boundable. Does that mean you're not going to be able to trade them, or just things that you're playing will drop? And then the second question is, is it just coming out for PlayStation 4? Um, okay, so uh, on the account binding stuff, so um, Josh was saying earlier at a couple of the panels, and we've been saying in interviews all day as well, that um, I think that when we had the auction house live and, and when, it, when it's down, that trading was a valid way to get items, but the scale had gotten way out of whack, so that trading became the easiest, fastest, best way to get items as far as an efficiency point of view goes. So we wanted to rebalance that essentially. As such, um, we still do see the value of trading, and we want there to be um, a good social aspect to trading. So we're trying to keep the rules as wide as possible. Quite likely, and this could change by the time we ship, by the way, so by all means, come on the forums and, and express your opinion on this item. Um, probably the very top tier of items, maybe just the top tier of legendaries will remain account bound. Um, and probably commodities as well. We probably want to avoid having another Stone of Jordan situation where we get an alternate economy going because we didn't think this through. So we're working on all of this stuff um, and it's still being locked down. So by all means, express your opinion on that. Hello. Uh, oh, we get the PS4? Well, uh, Burger, I'm always stealing from him. But uh, anyway, so PS4's question, I'll answer it real quickly since he snuck two in there. Uh, early, early on this year, we came out with support for PlayStation 4. We want to make sure that we follow through with that here at BlizzCon and show you Reaper of Souls running on PS4. Future announcements are, are, are going to be in the future, but today it's all about PS4 on the console. Uh, I can do one better than that. Uh, we are committed to taking uh, your PS3 saves uh, to PS4. So he wasn't supposed to say that. We are committed to that. Um, yeah, I saw the Loot 2.0 information in the previous panel, and a lot of the items look really awesome. Do you guys have any plans for expanding the stash space so we can store all these items? Come on, Josh. Apparently I have to take this one. Um, so uh, at this point, no, uh, straight up, we're not intending to increase the stash space. Um, we're approaching the problem from a different point of view. We're trying to find more things to do with the items you have um, and less requirement or less need that you should feel to hold on to a lot of stuff. So there's a few different things we're doing for that. One of the main ones is enchanting and blacksmithing. So breaking items down, salvaging them is worth more. And if you have something that's almost good enough, of course, you can use enchanting to make it better. If you have a transitional item, let's say you found a level 40 legendary, you've hit level 50 and found something you want to replace it with, that breaks down and you can get one last hurrah out of that item by using the legendary salvage reagent to make your new legendary better. So that's just one example. We're trying to do a lot of stuff to make sure that you don't feel you need to hold on to a whole bunch of transitional gear. Many other things with Loot 2.0 is you're just getting better, smarter drops on a more frequent basis. Uh, that, that, that requirement, whatever it is that you're trying to hold on to, you just don't need to do it as much. So we're trying to make better use of the space you have. And we think that that's actually a much better, more fun solution than giving you more stuff that you need to manage. Thank you. Right up to the white line. So the less is more uh, philosophy is really good, but we still need crafting materials. Uh, how do you plan on reconciling the two, and will we ever be able to do anything with whites and grays? Uh, 
Currently, we're uh, we, in, in our internal build. Um, the white items do salvage into some basic crafting material. Um, we're kind of looking at crafting as a whole. Uh, one of the changes that we're making uh, is the uh, in the live game, you have your normal crafting reagents, Nightmare, Hell, and Inferno at the different tiers. It's a little bit awkward because you'll enter Hell, and all of a sudden, all these crafting materials that you have become useless. So we're actually unifying that across the board. So from 1 to 60, you'll use the same single tier of crafting reagents. Uh, we want reagents to matter. We want you to be able to salvage those things, but we don't want it to become like a huge bookkeeping chore. I think that's actually completely new information, isn't it? Have we uh, said that before? Maybe. I think we've said it before. OK. Well, keep asking good questions. We'll see how much more we can slip up with. <laughs> hey, uh, this is a bit of a lore question. I missed the lore panel. Um, a few years ago, I was at BlizzCon, and I asked about the sister of the Scythe Sci, And um, I can't remember who replied, but he said that they were definitely going to be part of the game in some aspect. And uh, when I played Diablo 3, it was not there at all from what I could see. Can you give me an update about what happened or if they're going to be coming back in some way or, or touched upon? I, I would love to give you an update. I just didn't hear, though, the specific thing you said you asked about. <laughs> oh, I was um, asking if they were going to talk about what happened to the sisters, so the Sisterhood of the Silas Eye, um, specifically you know, how the rogue's doing after their ca uh, cathedral got all blown up by Andario and stuff like that. I'm, I'm really sorry. I just still didn't hear the word. The, what, what, what happened word? to the rogue? Oh, oh, the sisterhood. The sisterhood of the Sai. Si, sorry. Oh, of the Sai. Yeah. Um, there was, uh, during development of Diablo 3, I think there were a lot of, a, a lot of plans. Um, you know, a lot of things that, that people tried. Uh, you know, we explored putting certain things in, and sometimes it just became too much information, or there was no good place for it. So, um, you know, obviously, things change in development quite a bit. Um, but uh, I think that um, the Book of Tyrael and uh, the Book of Cain both uh, um, would explain a little more about what, what is going on with them and, and a lot of other factions and, and such. Hi guys, uh, just want to give a shout out to Waxack on Twitch and my question is um, I noticed on the floor there there's some new monster affixes like Poison Enchanted and I think Frozen Spike. Um, do you plan on expanding on that concept a lot more because it's uh, pretty boring right now to be honest with the current affixes that are in live. So I just wanted to know if you had anything new planned there. Uh, yeah, the, um, the monster affixes, the goal is to combine the abilities that the monsters have with a uh, random affix pool. Um, we are adding a few new ones in Reaper of Souls. Um, but on that topic, we're also looking at the monsters that exist and making sure that their abilities are really shining through. Because every, you know, it's kind of a balance, right? You have every monster who exhibits their personality and their unique abilities. And then the idea is that you layer on top of it these random affixes. And we want both sets to feel as rich as possible because, you know, at the heart of Diablo is randomness. And one aspect is the, the combat and the, and the challenge that the monsters present. So uh, it's a system that we're you know, always working on, and uh, you'll, you'll see some more in Reaper. Thanks, guys. How far along are you in Reaper of Souls? I, I, uh, I know that you probably don't want to answer. We're as far as what you see out there. Ah, <laughs> that, 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 that's very revealing. Um, we, secondly, uh, I, will, I will say that you know, certainly we understand you, know, you guys want content. You want it you know, probably at a more regular basis than we've given it to you in the past. We did spend a lot of time giving you eight updates uh, to the base game. Uh, and that has necessarily led to some, some delays in getting Reaper Souls out. But uh, we're fully committed to, to getting stuff to you quickly. But we also want it to be the highest quality that we can make it. And uh, secondly, do you guys see more classes and, dare I say it, maybe a second expansion down the road? I know you don't want to answer that one either. Oh, no, no, I, th I think we have an answer. Um, maybe. Nice, <laughs> nice. Hey guys, I just want to say thanks for making such an awesome game. Uh, I've been a longtime fan of the Barbarian class, and one of my yeah, yeah Sons of Bull Kothos. Um, 
One of my favorite things from D2 was finding a really awesome two-handed weapon and putting it in one. Are we bringing that back? Well, I mean, the Crusader does have a passive that allows him to hold a two-handed weapon, you know, in one hand and a shield in the other. So, I mean, you can definitely do that. You notice the Crusader's not a barb, right? Thank you. Uh, I know. <laughs> Woo! Okay. But it's still White's favorite class, right? <laughs> totally. Uh, hello, I have two questions from uh, some people on Reddit. One is, uh, will you have ladder exclusive drop items? And the second will, uh, is, will you provide beta keys for those who pre-order? Um, so, I mean, we're not talking about ladder, we haven't announced any ladder um, systems. Uh, what we do know is that there's a, a desire for something. I mean, D2 obviously had, you know, uh, uh, ladder specific rune words and stuff like that. So uh, if we were to look at a feature like that, we would look at, you know, what is most appealing about that type of gameplay and how can we design the best experience for that style of gameplay. As for, as for keys. The, the other, what was the other question regarding pre-orders? Beta keys. Uh, well, you have beta keys. Oh, I see. Are you know, we going to have betas available? Yeah, we haven't, we haven't announced pre-orders yet or any special uh, exclusives. Uh, our marketing guy was just out here, and I threatened to bring him up on the stage to answer those kind of questions, and he's running the other way. So if you, if you take off right now, he's the blonde guy. Uh, his name's John. Uh, but otherwise, you'll have to wait for the, the announcement. I'm sorry. Hey guys, I'm a big fan of the game and um, I'm really happy that you guys are adding a clan support to uh, Reaper of Souls. And I wanted to ask, is there going to be a full-on uh, chat lobby like there was with uh, Diablo 2 and um, Battle.net 1.0? Or are we going to keep the WoW-like chat interface? Uh, so, partially, but not, not exactly what you're talking about. So there is a... Um there is a clan roster window, and we've shown some screenshots of that where you get to see the miniatures of people, and there's dedicated clan chat. We actually have made some, some major improvements to the chat interface, but we haven't gone back to the lobby system. It is something that we've discussed before, and I think that it does give a nice sense of community to it. So between the, the clans and the group's features and the chat improvements, we're gonna see how this goes over the next few months um, and try to build on what we have. And I think that it is definitely getting a lot better. So when you guys do get a chance to try that out, please send your feedback. We are reading it on the forums. Um, anything that you're putting in there about those systems specifically, I'll be reading. And uh, we go over that actually once a week, so. Hi, I actually had uh, two quick questions. The first one was, I may or may not have read some data mined information about a game mode called Devil's Hand. I was wondering if you could even hint or elaborate on that, because it actually sounded like a really, really cool idea. No. <laughs> it's cool, oh, though. I will take that as a good hint. Secondly, the banners for the virtual goodie? Really? You couldn't give us like some wings or something a little cooler than the banner? Just saying. Ouch. I like the banner. Uh, actually, Kevin loves the banner, so it's Kevin's fault. Yay, banner. <laughs> They're awesome. Um, hi there, guys. Um, I just had a couple uh, quick questions about, like some of the builds. There's more like popular that are viable, like the Barbarian um, into the fray and Berserker Thrive the Chaos, and the Wizard Critical Mass and Archon. Are those going to be changing uh, in Reaper Souls? And also, um, is Life Steal going to be, you know, because it's almost a must to have. I'm in hardcore, and I know in softcore, but you need it to survive. Is there any going to be balancing on that aspect? 
Yeah, uh, I'll answer the second question first. Uh, we do see lifesteal as an issue. Um, it's not even so much the power level that it gives a player, but what it does for your perception of itemization as a whole. Uh, we have three stats that are on items for comparison purposes, your damage, your healing, and your toughness. And it's, it's really a shame that players are you know, hyper-focused on a single number of those three, only damage. And that's because lifesteal acts as a translation. It, it provides your healing and your toughness just by making your damage number higher. So it really distorts you know, how you evaluate and look at your items. So uh, life steal is not really good from that point of view. And we are looking to actually genuinely allow you to make conscious decisions about whether you want to have more toughness or more healing or more damage. And I think removing life steal allows us and players to, to do that. And regarding builds, um, you know, in Reaper, we've talked about Loot 2.0. And I think one of the general philosophies that's amazing about it is that uh, the legendaries open up new ways to play the game. So I don't really see builds as being just a collection of skills anymore and then items as being a bunch of numbers. I really, we're really looking forward to the idea that your legendaries plus your skills work together to make a build and that a particular way to play is unlocked by you getting that sweet new legendary. Hi, uh, my question is regarding Templars. Uh, first of all, love the class. I've been playing the demo like crazy and uh, awesome class. Um, mostly about balancing though, I felt like I was almost like a glass cannon. Um, I was dying very quickly, but annihilating everything. Uh, particularly, I can't remember the name of the ability, but it's the second one you can play on the number four ability. Um, it does 1,500% weapon damage uh, in a like, consecration effect on the ground. And it, I killed Asmodan in like four seconds. Um, so again, felt like a glass cannon. Is what that took the you so long? Uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, was that your intent? Is that something that's going to be changed? Uh, what do you guys think? Uh, there's, there's, just a, there's a few uh, simple things going on there that explains that. So we tend to overemphasize the um, combat abilities, like the direct damage abilities, when we put a demo build together, just because those tend to be more showy than the defensive stuff. And the other one is you're just not quite familiar enough with the defensive stuff. And then finally, the third one is, yes, we are still doing a lot of tuning. In that case, it's not a Crusader-specific issue. Um, we have some generalized um, health and damage numbers, which, are, which do have class-by-class class, um, effects on them. And so probably both the Crusader needs to be tuned and the game damage um, at that normal difficulty level. And that happens all the time, once a week probably, why we're tuning those numbers. Oh, oh, at least. Yeah, until after release, right? Like when everyone hits it, we keep on tuning for a little while too. And thank you guys for everything. The game is awesome. Thank you. Thanks. How's it going? Excellent work on the job, uh, on the game. I have a question about, I, I like the direction you guys are going with like five levels deep. I want to see something more like an endless dungeon and Every 10 levels, you enter a room with like two butchers or something crazy where you have to further progress. And then if you die, that's it. You have to start all the way from one and go down to 150, whatever. Something like that. So that request has definitely come up before um, within the team and without the team. So um, I, I basically call that a bottomless dungeon um, because I, I make... I differentiate it from Endless Dungeon because we, we look at the Nephilim Rifts feature as an endless dungeon. It's not one dungeon, but it's an endless combination of all of the, the elements that we have with randomized monsters, levels, weather, etc. Um, some of it hand-touched, some of it completely random. So that is sort of an endless dungeon mode. I know that's different than what you're saying. However, Bottomless Dungeon has come up. Um, it's not something that we're working on right now, but it is an idea that we like, so hopefully in the future we can do something like that. Any, anything to do with death and like in softcore, if you like stay alive for like an hour, congratulations, here's a small buff, anything like that? Well, it's yeah, <laughs> nothing we've worked out yet. Um, yeah, we, we have talked about, so you can have a death penalty or you can have a stay alive bonus. Whenever possible, we prefer to give somebody a bonus for something as opposed to penalizing for them for something. You know, we have a death penalty that, that works well enough right now, but there's really no meaningful stay alive bonus outside of Nephilim Valor. So it is something that we, we 
do discuss. I don't think we have a solution yet, and it will keep going, working on it. And to follow up on that, I think, in fact, I think Wyatt and I have had uh, a number of conversations about this very topic, and uh, we, have to, we came up with some ideas. But if you guys have any ideas, you know, pass them along. You know, we're uh, it's definitely something we want to try to address. Hello. I know Order of Light is coming out at the end of February, and I wonder if you guys know if there are going to be any further tie-in novels. Um, it's actually Storm of Light. But, <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, uh, well, you know, our, our uh, creative development department is, is always looking at different ways to uh, continue to tell more stories in the Diablo universe. So, um, right now, I think the, uh, the novels are, are in kind of a good place. And so, yeah, I definitely see, uh, I see more coming on the horizon. Do you know if they're going to come out more than once every two years? <laughs> um, that depends. I think the way that, that um, we really approach it is, is uh, not so much a release schedule or like a release cadence. It's more when we have a story that we feel like we really want to tell. You know, so early on in the development of Reaper of Souls, uh, we realized that there was this entire story that took place between Diablo 3 and Reaper of Souls, you know, where Tyrael realizes that he's got a serious problem and he's got to solve it. And his solution to that problem is actually the beginning of Reaper of Souls. So, um, you know, that felt like a story that, that we could tell and that we wanted to tell. So I think whenever we find a story that we want to tell, then, then we start talking about, well, whenever we find a story that we want to tell that doesn't lend itself to being in a game, that's when we start talking about other media, you know, whether it's putting stories up on the web or, or graphic novels or, or novels. Okay, thank you. Hey guys, um, regarding Trivecta stats, there is a huge issue right now just because that's what everybody gears for. You want crit chance, crit damage, and attack speed. Is there anything that's gonna be done to kind of steer away from that? Um, because I know Pyrgon 2.0, you can put points in those stats, but as far as gearing goes, what else can we look for besides those three just because that's what makes us the most efficient? Right, absolutely. Um, so there's a sort of a, a multi-pronged approach on Trifecta. Um, I had mentioned before that uh, it's, it's really a shame that damage is the only thing that people really care about. Lifesteal is a contributor to that. By removing uh, lifesteal, we're hoping that maybe the, some of the over analysis on just maximizing your damage number will ease up a little bit. Um, things like like your increasing your toughness, your health will matter as well. Um, in addition to that, we have the primary secondary split, uh, which we had talked about earlier today, but uh, it allows you to get some bonuses like magic find or pickup radius, and it 's not competing directly with those you know primary stats. but most importantly, we don 't want to uh, take away trifecta, what we'd rather do is provide you with even more options. You know, if you can only have so many properties on an item, our goal is to actually say, you know what, instead of there just being three, what if it was, you know, seven or eight properties that you want, and now you're going to have to choose how you want to build your character. Cooldown reduction, uh, resource cost reduction, uh, el elemental damage, uh, bonus damage to a particular skill, all of these things will allow you to improve your character and give you more options than simply the trifecta. The, uh, the bonus damage to a particular skill is, is proving to be a pretty deep well that we can go to for replayability as well. Like I have frequently been changing my build um, just because of that. I start to find items to encourage me you know, say, do seven-sided strike, for example, which I didn't currently have in my monk build, I find one or two items and I still have them in my inventory, all of a sudden I'm using that and I'm starting to enchant other ones to, to up that skill as well. So that's an interesting one to watch for sure. Hey, what's going on, guys? Uh, currently, the elites and the uniques are pretty boring. It's basically uh, another monster, except it's blue and a little bit bigger, or gold and a little bit bigger. Is there any changes going to be made about that? Because it gets pretty boring just saying, oh, there's an elite pack. It's blue, you know? Uh, yeah, we've actually, uh, internally, we've done uh, some changes to uh, both uh, champion and uh, uh, rare packs. Um, champions, mostly, we vary the number of guys you're going to be running into. So the packs aren't always going to be three blue dudes who are the same. 
for uh, rares, what we've done is instead of having one big yellow dude and his three little friends who are yellow and they're the same, we're varying the numbers quite significantly, like from two to five, even seven, I think, for the minions. And we're also changing the composition of the minions so that they are different creatures. Sometimes it'll be, you know, a, a skeleton summoner with uh, two shield skeletons and three skeleton archers, or it could be a skeleton summoner with uh, five burrowers, for instance. We're uh, adding a lot of variety in the monsters that can accompany the boss monster in itself so that it feels every time like you're running into something cohesive and different and not just, hey, look, it's one dude and his mini me's. Thanks, guys. Woo. Hey. So one of the major critiques for Diablo 3 was, uh, you know, your weapon became your single most important item simply because all of your damage is derived from, like, a high top and damage. Like, why was that deemed, you know, the superior system? Because I always found it backwards for a wizard to be carrying a giant two-handed hammer as opposed to, like, an orb of Tower Rashaw. You know, are, are you carrying that same system over into Reaper of Souls? Or are you just going to keep it? Uh, yeah, we're pretty happy with it. Um, I know that th it's a series of design trade-offs. Um, you know, nothing comes for free sometimes when those tough decisions. Uh, the wizard um, uses their, you know, weapon damage uh, to power skills. That's, I, I recognize that's a departure from the way Diablo 2 did things, but at the same time, Diablo 2 had a different problem, which is that you sometimes didn't care about your weapon at all. Or there were certain inventory slots, and you know you could stack up magic find in every single slot because you didn't care about a lot of other stats. And um, so we had to make a trade-off, right? There's no easy answers. And we really felt that using weapon damage allowed everybody, all classes, to care about the stats on their, on their items. Thank you. How's it going, fellas? Really like the work you did. I'm sure you're wondering why I called this meeting. I'll be brief. Um, question number one, demonic essences. Will they have any viability in Reaper of Souls? Will there be crafting plans above level 63 that will utilize demonic essences? Or my friends who have saved 3,000 of them, should they just start crafting away? And I, if you want to know my second question, so you can think of that one while you're answering the first one. Well, second, uh, I'll just, um, I, that one, I, I don't actually think we'll be able to answer that today for you. Sorry. Okay, no problem. The second question is, critical mass uh, is used in over 95% of all my friends' wizard builds for the obvious reason that it reduces cooldowns. And I know that you're going to have to do something about this passive. And after playing the demo, I, I love the direction that the game is going. But I'm curious, is the problem more with the passive or the way that it is used with a skill like, let's, let's say, um, Frost Nova? Uh, I think the problem is it, it might be with the passive itself. Um, I think that there's, uh, it's aggravated by uh, extremely high proc scalers on a number of wizard skills. Um, I think that we want to be looking at the proc scaler side. I think we want to be looking at the passive itself. We want, I think we want to make sure that the wizard has viable alternative passives that are exciting to use. Um, Frost Nova itself, I don't think is a problem. So uh, there's no plans to, to alter that. I think it's really fun to be able to CC an enemy. I think it feels powerful to perma CC an enemy, but ultimately is bad for the long-term health of the game. So uh, I think we want to be in a place, uh, however we get there, where uh, Frost Nova is still good, and I get a good long CC out of it when I use it, but I don't think we want to be in a place where I can perma stun enemies all the time. Thank you very much. Hey everyone, um, I have my own question, plus I've got a question here on the forum that I want to relay over to you guys as well. Um, for the first part is, Right now, Ubers are part of the quote-unquote endgame content you can explore, um, but you need to do them for the Hellfire rings. Is there a place for something like this in the future with 70, level 70 items and content? Okay, so um, yes, there could be a place for something like that in the future, but we're not uh, announcing anything about something new with Ubers today. So you had another question, though? Yeah. Okay, this one's from the forum, and it's mostly do dealing with categorization. Um, the first one is, why did you split the item properties into categories? 
Um, the second one is, why did you split Paragon points into categories? And the third one is, what about elective mode, just like skill categories? That's, that's not more than one question, I think. Categories. Um, <laughs> Okay, so uh, what was the first question again? Okay, yeah, the first one is why did you decide to split item properties into categories? And I, I like to add that will this impact the mystic rolling different things for those categories? Okay, so yeah, so the reason why we did that is, is pretty straightforward. I think that there's some item properties that can just never match some of the trifecta or primary stat ones. It really doesn't matter how big your, your gold um, uh, or health gold pickup radius is, it's never gonna be on the same thing. So if ever you have an item where you could choose between more intelligence for your wizard or that, it's always gonna lose out. But it, it's, it's valuable to have secondary uh, skills, nice to have skills like that. So we wanted them basically just not to compete with the main skills. So the, the not skills, sorry, the, the main um, properties. So the, the properties that are the most competitive, the ones that give the item the majority of its power, they've been categorized so that they can be trade-offs against each other um, on a more equal playing field. And I think that gives valuable depth to it and it should add some choice back in, especially with the addition of some of the new ones. So that's the reason why. And yes, uh, with, the, with the Mystic, you can enchant the secondary or the primary um, uh, properties. Oh no, um, the chanting as in, if you enchant the secondary property, is it possible to reroll a secondary property into a primary property? N uh, no, no, a secondary property rerolls into other secondaries, primaries reroll into other primaries. Um, when you go to do the enchanting um, and you choose the property you want to, it shows you which category it's in and it shows you all the things that could potentially roll so you're not going into it blind. Out of time. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I wanted to tell you I love Diablo 3 and I'm looking forward to the Reaper of Souls. Um, my question is about the Collector's Edition. Um, if you do a collector's edition of Reaper of Souls, could you ensure that there are enough of them available that anyone who wants one can get one without having to go to a scalper? Uh, we'll certainly take that under advisement. I think always the best thing is, you know, I hate to say it, but for fans to show their interest on the pre-sale side, because that gives us a strong indication, or at least retailers a strong indication of, of how many units. We don't actually determine how many units get manufactured. Retailers generally tell us, hey, here's how much we want based on the demand that we're seeing. So uh, if you guys make a lot of noise, then uh, we'll be happy to make more boxes. Cool. Thank you. How are you guys doing? Um, my main question was the fact that people like ourselves who have actually been playing since Diablo 3 first came out and we get up to MP10, uh, are we going to be so overpowered that we're just going to raffle stomp through the expansion? Uh, no. <laughs> um, so uh, it, it, it's challenging, honestly, to have um, such wide variation in the uh, item game where two level 60 characters or in the future two level 70 characters could have such an incredible disparity. But we like that as well. Like we, we don't want you to be able to simply max out, oh, I've got everything and I'm done now. You know, we don't want that to happen in any short period of time. If, if you enjoy playing the game, if you're still enjoying killing monsters, we still want you to have some sort of carrot that you're chasing after. So we don't want to stop that from happening, which would be the easiest solve. So we have, um, you know, 60 to 70. There's, there's uh, um, some power inflation for sure. And it's not so much that it's out of, out of control yet. Um, and in addition, we will have more approaches to difficulty um, for people like that where you know, they can tune things to be a little more difficult for them. Essentially, it's probably not going to be monster power, but we probably give you know, overgeared characters more ways to, to play as well and to tune that up more. So when you do get to that long end game and you've got a lot of paragon levels or something that you're still finding something that's challenging for yourself. So I don't know if I answered the question well, but. First off, I ran into your wife, Brian, and she put me up to this. I apologize ahead of time, but uh, <laughs> thank you. I actually have well, I actually have a legitimate question uh, regarding the art direction of angels as enemies. Now that we're seeing them as enemies in uh, Reaper of Souls, I was wondering if you're going to deviate from the humanoid with wings aesthetic. Uh, I know lore-wise they're creatures of orders, but we might see something akin to like the weird configurations you'd find like the Old Testament, just in terms of uh, art and lore. No, I didn't. 
So we had a little trouble understanding, so I'm going to repeat it, and if I'm wrong, let me know. So regarding the arch direction for angels as enemies in Reaper of Souls, um, are we, we're sticking a lot with the humanoid, or at least as you've seen, and you're asking if we're going to go to some more crazy variations on angels? Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, older legends describe them as like wheels made out of various animal body parts, or just something more along the lines of the variation we see with demons. You see so many different kinds of demons, but only one kind of angel. Uh, okay, so that's a good question, actually. Um, so it's pretty challenging to design stuff like that, because what ends up happening oftentimes is that people have very specific views of what they think it should look like. And uh, so we already have established looks for the angels from, you know, past games, obviously. Uh, so we sort of have to stick to that and make sure that we sort of use an evolution of that look, but don't, I mean, make it interesting, but not go away from it. Now, when it comes to Mouth Hill's, uh, uh agents and what they look like, uh, from the lore point of view, I think we really want to tie them very much into the angelic uh, side of it. Uh, we felt like that was going to be the really interesting sort of look for them. And uh, so we used uh, the idea of constructs that basically, they're not demonic necessarily, but they're these sort of uh, things that he's created and, and turned into uh, uh, bastardizations of angels, so to speak. So uh, we try to support that visually and, and sort of give that look to it, you know? So it's angelic armor with these sort of monstrous sort of looks. Um, and uh, we just want to make sure that it didn't read like demons straight up, you know, like that would have been a little bit too uh, easy, I think. Uh, so that was the goal behind that. Yeah, actually, I'll, uh, the angels, um, the angels uh, closer to Malthael have become corrupted in different ways. And, and like Christian said, differentiating really carefully between angels and demons, even though the angels are doing something horrible to humanity, that doesn't put them in the exact same category as demons. They're still enemies. It's still a three-way system in there. So it's important that we, we keep the um, idea behind what corruption from demons uh, looks like totally different from that of angels. So some of the angels you'll see in Pandemonium uh, that we haven't actually shown yet, maybe you've seen glimpses of them in some of our gameplay videos, um, are starting to look more different than the angels you've seen thus far. Thanks. Sorry it's slightly off topic, but um, maybe in the expansion you included as bonus content, I was wondering if you had plans to, or I guess, would you please consider releasing Diablo 1's original soundtrack? I'm sorry, was the question, are we going to include Diablo 1 as bonus content? That was just a suggestion of I when see. to do it, but I was just asking if there are any plans to ever release Diablo 1. You know, it's, it's certainly something that, that we've, we've talked about. We know there's a lot of nostalgia around those games. Um, I don't know, my own personal experience is that oftentimes when, when we see those old games on you know, new screens, new technology, high resolution, it, it sort of takes the blush off the rose. You know, so uh, we always wonder you know, if, if we were to put it out there and try to put it side by side with you know, the majesty of something like D3, if it would really still hold that. So it isn't something that we completely would be against, but it is not something we plan on doing for, uh, for Reaper. I think uh, he, he was asking about the, the soundtrack, right? Oh, I'm, I'm totally sorry. I thought, I thought you were talking about including the game in there. Oh, that was a good answer, though. But I answered a completely different question, so you can sit down. Go ahead. Right, but the soundtrack. I, I can't answer the soundtrack one. You, you want to you give that a shot? I, I think it's a good idea. We should talk to people. So. And actually, like I said, our marketing guy is hiding in the back there. So uh, if he's planning content for you know, collector's edition or whatever, that might be a good thing we could toss in. Hey guys, um, just a quick question. Since you're limited by gear in D3, um, and MP10 was an awesome addition, um, using that same formula that you used, would you consider getting rid of the MP10 drop down menu and just change it to a slider so you can go to, say, MP100 or whatever you want? Even though you'll get crushed in one hit, it's just for the challenge. So yeah, the MP system was was something of a stopgap. I think it pretty did a pretty decent job um, for the you know for for the goal that we had when we patched that in. Um, we have discussed trying. I think we're going to call it difficulty 
Um, first off, I'd like to say I love the direction you guys are taking Reaper of Souls. Um, I'm surprised no one has asked before, but is there any kind of update on PvP Arena? And um, what about a new follower with a new expansion? All right. All right, so PvP. You know, this is something that a week doesn't go by that somebody at the office doesn't come up and ask, what's up with PvP, Josh? Um, you know, and this is something that obviously is something that we're interested in exploring. It's something you guys want to do. I think the real challenge for us is finding a PvP mode that really feels like it can do justice to what the core fantasy of Diablo is all about. Like find a little closer. Almost. Oh, sorry. Did you guys hear anything? <laughs> all right. So we're really trying to find a way to express PvP in a way that does the core fantasy of Diablo justice. But one of the focuses on for us on Reaper is just focusing on the core elements, loot, the heroes, and I think we're off to a really interesting direction, and I think the future is going to be very interesting. Okay, so what Josh just mentioned about focusing on the core actually applies to the followers as well. So we had a serious talk about adding a new follower um, early on in the development of the expansion. What we decided to do instead was we wanted to deepen the followers that we already have. Brian could probably give you a couple of examples of things we're doing for that right after this. Um, so. Like he said, the core, we have three followers and we feel like we, we did not do everything that we wanted to do with them and some of the stuff we did do we felt we could improve on. So we took the same amount of development time and we put it into making them better instead. You want to give a couple examples? Sure. I, the, the really big thing uh, from a, a narrative and character standpoint that we're doing with the followers is uh, in, in Diablo 3 you could go and talk to them in town and sort of hear their backstory and learn about, you know, where they came from and all of this, um, which, was, which was good, but it was still just a conversation. Um, now, in Reaper of Souls, uh, their story is going to continue to move forward. Each, each follower's story will, will still develop and evolve. So now it's not backstory. Now it's happening real time. And you're, you, you still talk to them quite a bit, but you're actually able to go on an adventure with your follower and help their story advance and help them develop as a character. They'll also get a good tuning pass as well. Thank you. Thank you. Hey guys, um, I was wondering if you guys have ever discussed the option of removing the strobe light effect when monsters take hits, because I feel like it takes away from the gothic feel and the fantastic monster art. Want me to take that one? Um, you know what? There's a lot of choices we make oftentimes that maybe aren't really real, quote unquote, right? Um, I would say highlighting the monsters with the uh, outlines, that's one of them, right? Um, but I think when you're playing a game, uh, we really try to focus on legibility, right? So a lot of the stuff we're doing as far as art goes, uh, I'll give you an example. We use uh, backgrounds that are a little softer. Uh, your uh, monsters and characters are a little bit uh, harsher. They have a little uh, different light, actually. Uh, we, we play a little bit of a trick there. Uh, cast on them so that they pop from the background so you can read them easily. And uh, I think the highlighting is a little bit of uh, the same choice. Like, you want to see what kind of damage your stuff's making, right? You want the visual feedback of, hey, I'm hitting this guy, I'm hurting him, he's about to die, without having to look at the health bars or have them uh, above the heads or stuff like that. So I think um, it takes away from reality a little bit, but hopefully it makes it a little bit easier to read and a better game as a result. Um, it's a good point, though, uh, and we struggle with that stuff because we're trying to find that uh, sweet spot between what feels really dark and, and gothic and has, has a sort of nice Diablo feel to it. At the same time, though, make sure that everything reads really well and you're not getting frustrated because you can't click on it because you can't see it or you don't know how much damage you're making because you have no visual feedback. So this question is for the min-maxers in all of us, I think. Um, across the board, Blizzard games seems to have a lot of extensibility in add-ons and like the StarCraft map editor, or the World of Warcraft add-ons in Lua, et cetera. And in Diablo especially, there's DPS, but your character sheet DPS doesn't line up with your effective DPS. So is there a way that there could be some in-game tools maybe added other than just percentages that would tell you you're going to do this much effective DPS without having to go kill a boss to figure out how long it takes to kill, et cetera? Uh, yeah. Um, 
So, so one of the, the difficulties for just you know, the audience in general is um, there's always a conflict between um, maybe what, the, what, the, what we want to do as players and uh, what we want to do as designers. And this is one of those areas where sometimes it, it's hard because I, I wish the focus wasn't so high on damage. You know, that's something that's been come up earlier today as well. Um, there are, uh, Diablo's an action RPG. And it's, um, I don't think the game's in a good state when everyone's hyper-focused on something like how much damage did I do? And if I'm in a four-player party, everyone wants to compare, you know, who did the most damage to the boss. I mean, I think that elements like who crowd controlled the boss or, and, and froze it, or um, mobility, or um, having an interesting build, or amplifying the damage that my party mates do to it. Like, there's so many elements that I would like to have matter more than just my damage. Um, so I think that when we look at the game, like, we're focused more on a variety of like combat experiences and combat pacing and making sure that I'm I'm playing strategically um, and that uh, that I really you know wouldn't want to provide even more tools that cause people to become even more hyper focused on maximizing a number. Hi there. I've got a question for the UI. Uh, I play in iFinity, and I first of all appreciate that you guys are willing to allow that. And one of the shortcomings is that whenever I open my inventory or character windows, they are way over here and over here, and I have to actually turn my head to look at them. And I was wondering if you have plans to potentially allow me to sh have the UI ref get constrained to the center monitor or let me move my mini map or expand it so that I can have it open on my right monitor bigger. I, I'd love some customization in the UI. Well, uh, I'm really glad that you're playing it on that monitor and that it works so well for you. I think that's really great. Um, but uh, yeah, right now we don't have any plans to customize the UI. Sorry. Constrain it? Nothing? You just wanted a little? Just let it reflect. Just a, a little it. moved in? Yeah, uh, just, sorry, we don't have any plans for it. You. I'm sorry. Oh, come on, can't you code that up tonight? Come on, he asked nicely. He was really nice. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's something that we will consider for down the road, though. There are other people like you, though. Thank you. Hey, guys. Um, my question is sort of related to all the questions you fielded regarding the trifecta. Um, right now, every class has a talent or a skill that allows you to convert your critical chance into resources. Um, like extra spirit when you crit with one of the generators for the monk. Um, so I'm wondering, is you going to do anything to try to split those? Because right now, when I see something like the frost burns in the screenshot earlier with no crit, I think, oh, I'm going to be limited with my resource generation. And I'm wondering if those are talents are going to stay or go away or what? Uh, the um, you know, it, it, it's like you were saying, it, it, it's, it's the over-focus on, on trifecta, you know? I don't think our job is to, or our responsibility is to, to, to make crit worse. That's, our, our job is to give you more things that you might want to do instead. So I think that we should be looking at um, passives or, or rune options that make cooldown reduction you know, even better. I mean, what a, what a great place we would be if you're like, oh man, you know, uh, I, I don't think I want crit on this item because I'd rather have resource cost reduction and cooldown reduction because that's way better for my build given the legendary that I just got. So, so no plans to, uh, to, to directly hit crit, you know, head on. Okay, thank you. thank you. Hey guys, thanks a lot for all you do. I really appreciate it. Man, that light is bright. Uh, I play uh, NVIDIA 3D on my BenQ monitor, and when I was playing it, I was like, wow, when I was in Chaldeum, the, the particles are right in my face. I absolutely loved it. I don't know if that's something you guys directly did, but going to, to the PS4, were you guys implement a 3D capabilities in that? I think it would be really cool. Matthew? Jason? He's a... How about, how about Jason? Uh, no, well, actually, no like that here. Actually, uh, that, that's a pretty good suggestion. Uh, we haven't planned anything like that for the PS4, but I think that's a pretty cool idea. I mean, we're always trying to make the game look better on PS4 because it's got so much horsepower there. So uh, 
Thanks for that great suggestion. If you hear very carefully, you can hear the lead engineer on console who is somewhere in the hall dying as we speak. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Hopefully, you said you played the PS4 version, but hopefully, if all of you, if you haven't given it a shot, you should take a look at it. It really looks beautiful. We're at 1080p, and uh, it's pretty glassy frame rate on it, and this is just the beginning. Hey, um, my question is about PvP. Um, I played World of Warcraft professionally, and I've spent thousands of hours on Diablo 3, uh, almost all of that on hardcore. I was really excited about Diablo 3, and I have loved the game, but I was disappointed when PvP got thrown on the back burner. Um, I understand that it's very challenging to create like a meaningful like mode for that for Diablo. Uh, my question is whether or not you have ever considered uh, incorporating PvE elements to a PvP mode in order to make it feel better so it's not you know, all about the balance between the classes, but there's this tussle between, you know, how you're fighting the monster, you know, racing to fight this monster at the same time as other people, but you can fight them to stop them from doing it, et cetera, et cetera. I, I think, uh, you know what, I, I, I answered the question the first time, I was trying to figure out how to express the fantasy of Diablo in the PvP setting, and I think that element of adding PvE elements, I think there's something there and you know, when we have discussions you know, some and ideas along those lines come up and I think that you know, as we keep thinking about it, as we keep sort of, sort of uh, brainstorming, I think that's part of the solution, it's somewhere in that space. Maybe it's not PvP but maybe it's PvEVP or something like that but again it's just you know, right now we're just focusing on what's in front of us and uh, hopefully at some point in the future uh, we, can, we can have an announcement. Uh, so today during your gameplay system panel, uh, you were talking about the right click and drag thing with the mouse, and I was wondering how that would work on the PS4. Sorry, uh, oh, uh, do you mean the, the specific Crusader skill? Yeah. Well, I heard that, but I also heard it about like other moves, I think, where like it was... Uh, <laughs> Important to, to use the mouse, but the PS4 doesn't have one. Okay, so the um, if, if I remember correctly, um, we had a specific um, skill where the power was coming down from heaven, and we showed three iterations of it. The first two were ones that required mouse movements, and both of those we actually got rid of because we didn't feel that they controlled very well. So the the final version of the skill actually um, we've given the effect its own AI. So you just fire it off as a crusader, and it goes ahead and starts attacking monsters for you. It almost becomes like a, a mini holy hand of God fire thing from the heavens that that works like a pet. Uh, so we shouldn't we probably won't have that that issue um, unless you meant something else. But I I think that might be what well, you're referring um, to. There are certain skills. Definitely, you're right. There are certain skills that uh, require a little bit more precision. You know, like. For instance, a falling sword, uh, a barbarian's leap ability, where you're able to target specifically exactly where you want to go. It's more of a challenge on the console side, I think, and we tend to err more on making sure that the game feels very responsive, very kinetic, very dynamic, even if we lose a little bit of precision. Uh, so you're probably going to see solutions similar to what we did with Lee, where if you just tap the button, it's going to jump where you've targeted, uh, on the monster you've targeted. If you press and hold, it'll jump the full distance. Is not an ideal solution, uh, and we're still looking at and maybe finding something better. But you're probably going to see something in that regards because it keeps the game dynamic and fast paced, which is more important uh, to us than having you know pinpoint accuracy in the same way that it is on PC. Uh, hello, you announced that um, the weapons that are going to be dropping are going to have elemental effects. And in current Diablo 3, only cold has a specific effect where it slows. Can you give us more specifics as to what a poison enchanted or a arcane enchanted weapon is going to do? Want to do it? I can. Uh, we haven't worked that out yet, so um, leave that for today, I guess. <laughs> Hi guys, um, 
I was a big fan of D2 and uh, being a necromancer that could summon 15 skeletons and just wreck everything. <laughs> and with glyphs and D3 with witch doctors, I, I feel sort of limited in what I can summon and do. And I wondered if you've considered maybe being able to get experience through your glyphs or your spells in order to increase the amount of creatures you can summon or missiles that you can project. So the, basically, can we have a lot more pets for the witch doctor? Is that basically what you're asking? Not just the witch doctor. Missiles for uh, wizards or sorceresses, excuse me or anybody that has any form of missile or pets or anything that can grow your damage. Right, okay, so um, keep in mind that the damage is, is um, organized around the amount of stuff that you can have on screen right now. So just you know, doubling or tripling that I think can be done most effectively through Uber skills like the new Demon Hunter skill um, where basically every type of ranged attack is coming off of her at the same time. Um, that's one way we might do something like that. But the, the approach that we're taking from the ground up, um, or that you mentioned, like the Necromancer, where he just has 15 skeletons, we have fewer pets, and we recognize that the pets that we have for the Witch Doctor weren't doing the equivalent damage of necessarily 15 skeletons. And there's different ways to make them better. They are getting an overall tuning pass so that pets can be effective at endgame and higher difficulties. Um, many people are leaving them off their build because the pets, just they're just not worth it, right? Um, so we're trying to fix that aspect of it. Um, and partly it's sometimes a technical issue as well, where we want to do fewer better things, and more isn't necessarily better. More can just mean more screen noise. We'd rather you have a few less but more powerful pets on your Witch Doctor, or you know, number of missiles in the air, so you can see where you are, you can see where your effects are going, and then we can fill the screen with more enemies um, instead. So let's give you more things to kill, even if there's less of you. And I like that approach, and I, I do think that there's something cool about the Necromancer filling half the screen with his own little mini army. We've lost that a little bit. We had the fetishes, and it's not quite the same as the skeletons and golems. Um, but we've gained something instead, which means we can put more of other stuff on the screen, most notably um, more uh, expensive, better-looking effects and way more enemies. Nephilim Rifts in particular, if you've watched any of the videos that we showed of that at the preview panel, you can see that on YouTube, I'm sure, at this point. There's some crazy high-density stuff in there. You know, you can have five minutes where the screen is just packed with skeletons and zombies. You can barely move. It's very interesting, um, without that legendary boots to let you move through monsters, it's very interesting to try to use your skills in a very different way in a room like that. The more players or player pets you put on screen, the less we can do something like that. So, like Wyatt mentioned, there's so many trade-offs in game design, and I think that we're about to give you some very interesting density challenges. And that's one of the advantages of, of doing it the way that we approached it. All right, thank you. Hey guys, uh, how do you feel about high-level rune or high-level gems dropping, like radiant star emeralds and things like that? Because you're probably sick of hearing about D2, but when a Zod rune dropped, it was like that month's memorable moment. So, like, if a radiant star emerald dropped, that's a pretty cool thing too. Yeah, we're um, that's something that we talk about. Uh, the um, there's uh, there's some changes that we're gonna have to evaluate. You know exactly what we want to do, particularly with the removal of the auction house. I think that the way that the gems were experienced by the player um, is really changed in the presence of an auction house. If you play through the game self found, you have you know you you're actually happy to to combine a few gems, and you ever actually never reach you know radiant stars or marquees. So we're definitely looking at um, what does uh, the removal of the auction house allow us to do or should we do uh, in the wake of, of that for gems. We have one more super quick question. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, my question is, with Diablo, it's very linear storyline. Um, it, with you guys wanting to put more random with all the adventure modes and stuff, is there any idea of making the event quests have consequences to them if you do them or not? Like, if you do one, somebody might turn evil that will show up and kill you. And if you don't do it, he might go out and not give you a sword or something like that that you want. It feels like I don't have control over if I want to do an event or if it has any consequence. 
So um, putting consequences on them, like tying a random event into stuff that's happening elsewhere in the world, we definitely have tried that um, long before Reaper of Souls and Diablo 3 developments. And it works, it, it's fun in the way that you describe, but it causes one problem in that it, it removes a potential for randomness in the other situation as well. So when we have, like, it basically it makes your game more complex um, and it makes you have less randomness elsewhere. So if you did one thing, maybe even a little bit unintentionally, you just ran an event, and you're taking something else away uh, otherwise, and, and it slows down our, our rules and our ability to roll more random worlds. So we've decided to try to keep things more self-contained. You see this all throughout Diablo, Lombo for Reaper of Souls. Most of those events are self-contained because we can do so much more with the game after that. And we do lose that sort of tied-in subplot connection to the world thing when we do that, but it, it gets us a game that moves much faster and allows you to leave whenever you want and come back when you want and still get things rolled. We don't have to start saving like 20 different choices you made in that game and therefore having 20 fewer random things that happen next time you enter the game. So we chose the randomness over that um, connection. But there is, um, I, remember I, I mentioned before about uh, going on an, ad an adventure with your followers. So um, in that particular case, if you don't uh, go on that adventure with them, then their story doesn't progress. So there is at least a consequence to your choice there, right? Um, and we do have a couple of events um, in part of the game that are actually sequential in the sense that if you're playing and uh, the first of this particular set of events rolls and you do it, then you have the chance to do the second event, which builds on the, the, the first. Not immediately, but...